No two brothers hold as much attention on YouTube as the Paul brothers, Logan and Jake Paul. Where Logan has grown for most of his scandals, Jake, on the other hand, cannot seem to stop creating them, and has become one of the most hated content creators online. Starting when he was just 16 years old, Jake's initial launch to stardom was due to the once popular social media platform Vine, where he then transitioned to a series on the Disney Channel, then later returned to YouTube. Throughout these ventures, Jake has accumulated scandals at a rate that it can almost be looked at as an achievement to have so many. Jake Paul has been accused of bullying, disturbing the peace, doxing, mistreating his team members, and heavily and possibly illegally monetizing his audience of 8 to 15 year olds, just to name a few. Because of his less than favorable image, most viewers and content creators that are not children greatly oppose Jake Paul and his antics, to the point that most videos discussing him are ones of denouncement. But no one can deny the hard work he has put into his channel and into projects which he holds passion for. While this constitutes a financial rise, his recent need to shift his brand and general audience to an older and forgiving audience is his struggle, as his image has been decaying and falling since his online inception. Learning the hard way that trading money for credibility and likability was a seemingly irreversible mistake, making this the simultaneous rise and fall of Jake Paul. On January 17, 1997, Jake Joseph Paul was born into a competitive family. Raised in Cleveland, Ohio, he'd often find himself competing with his older brother Logan Paul that is two years his senior. They'd often be involved in sports, and both had a high athletic prowess. This was further instilled by their father, Greg Paul, whom obtained much discipline from being in the army, to renovating houses for profit, and then owning a roofing company. Greg Paul would often involve his children into his work, as over the summers they would assist him with home renovations. Jake Paul, starting at around age 10, started playing football at his local school's league with his father as the coach. So not only was Jake Paul's father greatly involved with his first work experiences, he was also heavily involved in his sporting goals. Because at the time, Jake Paul and his father had a dream that one day Jake would be good enough to join the American National Football League, or the NFL for short. To find ways to improve his son's skills and training, Greg Paul purchased a camera to record Jake and Logan's games in order to figure out ways to better Jake's strategies. But Jake found a much different use for this new piece of equipment, and started recording skits and general home videos with his brother for no other purpose than recreation. But their inspiration for these videos changed when they discovered YouTube and found other sources of inspiration for their would-be skits. A massive inspiration came from the rising channel, Smosh, that consisted of two entertainers. Naturally, they wanted to create not just similar content to Smosh, but also market a similar brand. So they created Zoosh, and later Zoosh Extras that mostly hosted Logan Paul. It was within these videos that an early habit, or rather their promotive nature, would form when they were looking to monetize their videos through merchandise. Yeah, in case you haven't noticed, we opened an online store. It's called Zoosh Items. I'll put the link on the side. I think it's this side. Pretty sure it's this side. Uh, then you might want to check that out, maybe buy some stuff. Get some clothing, you know. But like most copycat channels and channels run by children, their videos truly only reached their friends and family, with many of the original Zeus videos being removed by the brothers later on. As for his personal life, as Jake was transitioning from middle school to high school, his parents divorced. Along with this, his dreams of joining the NFL and becoming a YouTube content creator seem unachievable and undesirable. But remaining athletic, he joined his high school's wrestling team that had already inducted his older brother. Come the summer, looking for a new purpose in life, Jay decided he wanted to join the Navy SEALs, and with his free time that he had that was not spent with working out, he started making videos again with his brother. These videos consisted partly of skits, with the majority of videos revolving around their definition of pranks with some prank videos being rather harmless and purely reactionary, while others created a bit of inconvenience to the pranked. While Jake did not really thrive on YouTube, he was soon to find a new media platform where he would thrive, when in 2013, 
Through Twitter, Jake Paul discovered the fledgling video platform Vine, a video sharing service where users uploaded and viewed videos that were 6 seconds in length. So in March of 2013, Jake Paul began uploading Vines. His initial ones, like most starting creators, made little sense, even in the context of the joke he was attempting to make. Two days after this, his brother jumped on the Vine bandwagon and so began their competition on who could gain the most followers. Though Jake was leading because of his head start, Logan had a better grasp at Vine as he had higher production quality, more comprehensible Vines. The brothers, on their separate accounts, commonly included one another and shared what few followers they had with having a mostly inconsistent uploading schedule where they take a few days to several weeks off, then upload many vines on a single day. Though things began to change around mid-2013 when the brothers started to get more traction due to a viral video where Logan, as Jake claims, hacks Vine as Logan had accidentally found a way to keep recording without continually holding the record button as was customary to the platform. This surprised new onlookers and gave Jake around 3,000 followers and Logan around 5,000, providing them a small boost that they would ride to the top. The brothers' synergy absolutely helped their growth, and so at age 16, Jake Paul began establishing his audience of younger viewers as many of his now more polished vines fit into two categories, skits or pranks. Where his skits were less controversial, some of his pranks were the source of much contention. On one hand, Jake had a lot of charisma and confidence when performing these, which won over many viewers. But on the other hand, assuming that some of these were not scripted means that it involved unknowing bystanders and it was showcasing his inconsiderateness and lack of empathy. As a reminder, he was not an adult yet and only 16 years old. Being that many of these videos performed well on Vine and he was getting a large following of 100,000 to eventually a million people, the natural direction of anyone following the success would be to ramp up the quality and intensity of whatever was working. As for Jake, he just found that niche at a younger age. Later, things were made a bit complicated when Logan graduated high school and moved away to attend college, which slightly separated the starting brands of Jake and Logan Paul. Jake, continuing to improve his vines, was eventually offered brand deals starting as low as $250. He also attended a meetup in Texas where he was paid $1,000 to do so. It was here, for the first time, he was exposed to a sea of screaming fans and was able to finally visualize his upcoming fame and size. So, looking to continue his growth, he created a separate YouTube channel from iDog and Jay Slice, which was formerly known as Zoosh. This channel, simply titled Jake Paul, hosted a compilation of his vines that he continued making throughout school. By his junior year, due to Vine and the brand deals he was receiving, he was already outperforming his parents financially, also meaning that his status on Vine was almost impossible to hide and had many lower classmen wanting to take pictures of him and generally adored him, while most of the upperclassmen belittled him at any chance. Hey guys, can I make some bracelets with you? Nobody likes you, leave! <laughs> with every single one of his wrestling matches being recorded by spectators his junior year, all six of his match losses could be found on Vine. It wasn't just the students disliking him, it was also his teachers. Jake, on multiple occasions, recounting when a teacher openly and negatively asked, as Jake claims, quote, what are you going to do when Vine dies, unquote. This negative environment where Jake was constantly shunned did two things. It created a hatred of the schooling system and those involved in it like his teachers and made him realize that he wanted to get out of this non-supportive environment. Jake now, deciding that he did not want to go into the Navy SEALs, wanted to strike it big in Hollywood. So he moved from his hometown in Cleveland, Ohio to Los Angeles, California to pursue this dream, all while remaining enrolled in high school through online schooling. His brother Logan, just finishing freshman year in college, had a similar idea and drove to Los Angeles where the two lived together. At this time, in 2014, Jake Paul was making around $8,000 a month, with him estimating that Logan was making slightly more than him, though most of their money, for the first couple of months, was used to pay rent, furnish their apartment, and to pay for other services and utilities. 
As for Jake's experience there, Jake spent most of his initial time in LA mingling and developing a social group. While doing this, he had his eyes set on becoming a traditional actor and knew that he wanted to use his social media platform to do so. But he knew just having a platform was not good enough as there were many other social media stars looking for the same roles that he was looking for, and he finally found a way to set himself apart. After failing horribly at several auditions, around 2015, Jake began taking acting and improv classes nearly every day. These lessons did not come naturally to him as he found much difficulty in trying to hone his acting skills, but eventually with a lot of hard work and dedication to trying to improve, he slowly but surely started performing well in auditions and got both large and small roles in low budget movies. This turned into much valuable experience and he eventually translated to an addition to Disney's upcoming television show, Bizarre Vark, where he and several other candidates did several circuits of auditions. To be honest, I have like a really big audition tomorrow and I'm really nervous for it. I don't really get nervous for anything, so I'm like, I don't know why I'm like this. Eventually, because of Jake Paul's charisma and the energy that he had with the other casted members, and also that he was a social media star, which plays into the characteristics of the person he was auditioning for, he got the role as Dirk Mann, a daredevil that made videos for a fictitious YouTube-style platform. With his focus on gaining this role, he had little time for other necessities like his online high school where he claims he graduated in 2015 with a 1.6 GPA, which was low because as he claims, he never did any of the homework but performed well on tests. But in some interviews, he says that he dropped out. Either way, now out of high school, he had the time he needed to focus on Bizarre Vark. This show had its characters also playing social media stars, and because of that, Bizarre Vark is often called a Disney Channel iCarly ripoff. Still, this was a massive break for Jake, working around 60 hours a week to film the first season, where he was still consistently uploading vines, and also posting YouTube videos in the form of vlogs, albeit inconsistently. Unsatiated even with all the work Jake was doing, he still searched for more ways to make money, and he found it. As around the start of 2016, Jake Paul started a business known as Teendom where he was seen often collaborating with other rising and brand new creators, he also had ulterior motives. He did not just want to be known as a Disney Channel celebrity or a social media influencer, he also wanted to be known as a billionaire and business owner, and had a vision of a company that would be able to artificially create social media stars by seeking out people that had good looks, a good work ethic, and charisma. The plan was to give applicants a platform that would kick off their social media career in exchange for 20% of their profits for 5 or so years depending on the contract they sign. Which going back to my first point is partially what Jake saw in some friends. Starting by experimenting on smaller influencers and attempting to grow their channel. After successfully promoting them and getting them from around 30,000 subscribers to half a million subscribers, he felt more confidence in his upcoming project and started recruiting more and more people for what he called a social media label. Outside of his secretive business venture, he continued to up the intensity of his vines and delved into practically any available social media to get the largest audience possible. On YouTube, he experimented with uploading longer forms of his vines. Though that might sound like a typical YouTube video, they were not. These videos were his vines, they simply had a lot more available footage that was not included in the vine and averaged about a minute long each. Like this video of him and his sports bike, which also played into his increasing recklessness as shown in his ability to do a wheelie and drive over 100 miles an hour though he was seeing a decrease in uploads. Not because he decided just to stop uploading, but rather he was caught in the production of Bizarre Vark, which aired June 24, 2016. Now Jake had an even younger audience, an audience one could argue was not even capable of using social media, when children as young as 5 years old would notice Jake from his Disney Channel show and approach him. As Jake later stated, he viewed these younger members of his audience as later potential revenue. As they'd grow up, he believed they would remain loyal fans, and once they had that, they were more likely to spend money on Jake Paul merchandise. 
that Jake, along with many other brand deals and sponsorships, promoted very heavily in most videos. This audience was something he could share with other creators for a profit, as he was now finally putting the final touches on Team 10, a collection of rising social media stars whom Jake helped grow. Like the Dilbray twins, which are the creators whom he initially tested his channel growth practice on, Alyssa Violet, a woman he met in Ohio two years prior and became somewhat of a love interest. So her, the twins, Jake, and three others made up seven members, not including the hidden workforce behind it. As many observantly noticed that there are seven members, but it's called Team 10. That's because Team 10 stands for Teen Entertainment and Media, the 10 representing the 10 digits in a billion dollars, which is how much he eventually wanted to sell Teendom, his company that runs Team 10, for. As seen from one of his videos that was also part of a sponsorship, Jake introduces his new house. This house would be known as the Team 10 house, having all of its members live under one roof, and to fund this project, Teamdom received an undisclosed amount of funding on July 1st, 2016. A month after this, the first video on the new Team 10 channel was uploaded where it introduced its members. This channel was practically a collaboration channel in where any member could appear, and was meant to direct attention to the members' individual channels. But unknown to many at the time, there were also ground rules for the Team 10 house, such as no alcohol or marijuana, or suffer a fine of $50 to $500. Also, any guest had to be vetted through Jake Paul before being allowed in the Team 10 house. And now that Jake had multiple mediums to broadcast himself on, he was further recognized in the many places that he vacationed and visited for brand deals throughout 2016 as seen on his YouTube channel that had around 250,000 subscribers at the time. That's quite the large gap from the around 5 million followers he had on his Vine account. And this became an issue, seeing as Vine was drastically decreasing in popularity by October of 2016. So for two weeks, Jake reviewed many of the popular vlogging channels on YouTube and wrote down what he thought worked and also what he thought he could do better and innovate to allow him to stand out from the rest. Which led to an announcement on October 8, 2016 where he stated he was going to start vlogging daily. I'm doing this. Vlogging. Vlogging. This is big, guys. I'm going to be daily vlogging. Actually, we're going to be daily vlogging. And behind the scenes, he hired an editor to edit these vlogs, allowing him to get a massive advantage to those who did not have an editor, as daily vlogs do take a fair portion of time to edit. Time that Jake Paul used to film more vlogs and upload more consistently than his competition. But even with this advantage, he was not getting where he wanted to be, and was greatly demotivated as his first few vlogs were only getting around 20,000 views per video. But this quickly started to change as his view counts through the following months were going beyond his expectation. Also around this time, he tried a new form of media and published a book called You Gotta Want It, which was Jake Paul's motto. A sort of autobiography slash motivational book. To say Jake Paul was involved in a lot of projects is a great understatement. He was in Bizardvark, managing Teamdom, Team 10, all his social medias, vlogging, and going to the gym nearly every day. He even started a separate YouTube channel called Jake Paul Biz, where he gave tips and tricks of how to grow a YouTube channel and manage a business. A business that he was attempting to get more investors to flock towards, like entrepreneur Gary V that in multiple videos is seen endorsing and promoting Jake and Teamdom in order to get more investors. As to how his main channel was performing, though he had experience with vlogs back in 2014 and in 2015, these new style of vlogs were very experimental as he was possibly trying to see what format could provide him with the highest amount of views so he could keep doing that style of vlog and build a larger audience. Looking back at a list of vlogs in late 2016, the more clickbait and wild the video was, typically the better it was going to perform. Him noticing this started to incorporate more pranks into his videos where the members of Team 10 were usually the target. He did have some difficulty though, like when his hard drive failed and lost the potential for some vlogs, but this was just a minor hiccup. 
because Jake was still being extremely productive and had nearly every video offer a wild activity, like riding in a jet plane, giving 500 Thanksgiving meals to the homeless, parentheses emotional, or constantly clickbaiting the trend that was the menacing clowns back in 2016, which mostly split his clickbait to his audience of children into three categories, pranks and wild activities getting a fair but least amount of attention out of all the clickbait, while over-sexualized thumbnails and horror clickbait with a strange combination of horror and over-sexualization of horror performing best on his channel at the time. So Jake's method of chasing numbers worked, even if the majority of content in the actual video contained little to none of what the thumbnail showed or what the title described. He also had another method to increase viewership, by having the first few seconds of any vlog show the most intense parts of what was to come, usually whatever the title was clickbaiting, then transition quickly to a random less entertaining segment. The reason the videos were edited this way was because with most videos, viewers usually decide if they are willing to watch the video judging by the first 10 seconds. So by showing the most intense parts, he had his viewers hooked and had free reign to do whatever else he wanted in his vlog. And this method very much worked. He was now getting, on average, half a million to a million views per video, when just two months prior, he was only getting around 20,000 views per video. So on December 22nd, 2016, the channel Jake Paul hit 1 million subscribers. Something that also helped his growth was not just that YouTube was aggressively promoting his channel, but his videos also sometimes appeared alongside Logan's videos so they could continually bounce viewers and attention to each other's channels, just like what they were doing when they were a part of Vine. The same thing happened to the audience of Vine. Because Vine announced it was closing, its viewer base was following its creators to YouTube. So it's safe to assume that a portion of these millions of followers of Logan and Jake were more susceptible to subscribe to Jake Paul's rapidly growing YouTube channel. And in a more bizarre turn of events, even the White House administration was interested in Jake Paul and people like him. So much so that he and several other creators at the start of 2017 were invited to visit the White House. But Jake, during this visit, had ulterior motives and wanted to extend his stay. So before attending, he hatched a plan to stay overnight at the White House. When arriving, he at times separated from his large group to scout out potential hiding places and eventually found a bathroom. So about 30 minutes or so before his group was meant to leave, he snuck into a stall of the bathroom he scouted out. Though a fair chunk of this video was just him in a White House bathroom stall, both the nervousness and excitement he had translated well to his audience as he could easily convey his reactions as many of Jake Paul's viewers lived vicariously through his actions. So in any moment of anyone watching this video, it wasn't just Jake Paul living through this audacious stunt, it was also the millions of viewers that were going to watch with him. After about six hours in the White House bathroom stall, and a call with his mother, he made his way out of the White House at around 3 a.m. By not acting shifty and attempting to seem like he belonged there, Jake Paul was able to secure an easy exit, and uploaded this video on January 6, 2017. This video was one of Jake's most successful vlogs, but in his success, he exposed a failure on behalf of the White House security team. So whenever he uploaded this vlog, the Secret Service took notice and paid his house a visit. But since he was not there, his assistant answered the door. Jake later scheduling a short interview with the Secret Service when he flew back to LA to simply verify that he was not a threat. This chain of videos worked as a miniseries for Jake Paul, which worked perfectly to grow his channel. Because in 2017, and even currently, YouTube prioritizes watch time. So if his young fans were constantly clicking on his daily vlogs to find out more about the situation he placed himself in, YouTube will notice this and promote his videos more heavily, which they did, gaining another million subscribers in January alone. This led to Jake doing a circuit of interviews that further spread his image on national television, and brought on more creators wanting to join Team 10. The more creators that joined and were contracted, the more he could potentially make, and others saw this as well. When investors put a million dollars into Teamdom during January of 2017, while it is true that most of the videos posted in early 2017 were prank videos with members of Team 10 as the targets, there was some variation like challenges that included trampolines and slime, two things that would easily gain a child's attention. 
There were also few serious videos, like when he discussed an accident that happened in 2016 when he lost control of his sports bike while filming another one of his dangerous videos, where he describes rolling over on the street and a car tire climbing over his head. His helmet was the only thing saving him from certain death. And for that reason, he no longer recklessly drives sports bikes. Comparatively, serious videos like these did not perform nearly as well as his highly edited clickbait vlogs. A clear example of his more serious content failing was in his channel Jake Paul Biz. Where his vlog videos were getting about a million views within about 3 days or so, Jake Paul Biz videos were getting around 10,000 to 100,000 per video. But the work and effort Jake puts into his vlogs should not be discounted. As every day for the next couple of months, he was coming up with new ideas daily and remained high energy throughout all of his videos. Then again, he did have more time because he did not edit his own videos, because he had a team of designers, editors, and other forms of help that assisted in running the machine that was Jake Paul. But he still did have direction in what he was doing, not just in his life, but also anyone that he brought onto Team 10. The newest members were Chance and Anthony, friends that he had made back in public school before his days on Vine. But this unbalanced dynamic of friendship and business, where Jake was at the top and had control over the major decisions of TN10 and its members, would eventually create a divide. But in the meantime, focusing on his personal success, Jake also won the Radio Disney Music Award for Favorite Social Media Star. At this time, even with Jake's stunts, him and Disney were mostly on good terms. But this was soon going to change as Jake and the other members of Team 10 were going to get into some massive publicity. Mostly bad, but publicity nevertheless. Something that he was more than used to getting due to all the public stunts he performed. We're gonna get kicked. <laughs> camera off of me, mister I want to be famous. You're <laughs> <laughs> famous, I mean you're not famous, you're a douchebag. He's actually never on growing YouTube channel. Yeah, he is. I don't care who he is. I like them <laughs> shoes, baby. But even his typical stunts were little compared to an upcoming, particularly controversial vlog that involved him, his dad, and a woman around Jake Paul's age. In a video titled, Kissing Contest, Me vs. My Dad, which describes the events of the video perfectly, as at the end of it, a woman, blindfolded, kisses three contestants. First, Jake. Second, Anthony. And lastly, his father. This was the video that the YouTube community used to label Greg Paul, Jake Paul's father, as a creep and further question the morals of the Paul family for three major reasons. First, the pressure of several guys coming to you asking to kiss you for a video that would be broadcasted to millions of people. Second, the age gap. Third, Jake's father kissed the same girl only moments after Jake was done kissing her. But the repercussions of this video would not be felt until he started becoming what can be described as a YouTube supervillain. All because of a sub 4 minute video he released on May 30th, 2017. This video did more to get him on the YouTube radar than any other of his videos, also uploading a vlog the same day showing the creation of this incredibly famous video. The video is none other than the It's Everyday Bro song, featuring Team 10. This song was written, recorded, edited, and uploaded all on the same day. And on the same day, it got around 5 million views and was the number one trending YouTube video on the entire site the following day, with a like to dislike ratio heavily in Jake's favor. This positive activity could also be seen on iTunes, where the song peaked at the number 2 spot. So it's safe to say that this video had an amazingly positive response, at first. Then because of its virality, it went beyond Jake's typical demographic of children and teens and landed on the feet of people much older and less malleable than his traditional audience and was picked apart as it served as a diss track, a form of music meant to challenge other creators or a group of people. But as many pointed out, his aggressive tone did not fit his rather innocent lyrics, like it's every day, bro, with the Disney Channel flow. Or some more confusing lyrics, such as and I just some new merch, and it's selling like a god church. Note that there is a comma between God and Church, but many paired the words God and Church together and were confused by its potential meaning. But he was not the only person getting hate for this video, as practically everyone on screen was, like Nick Crompton, 
the person that at the time was the COO of Team 10 who mostly focused on the business side of things unless Jake requested additional talent. But Nick Crompton's image was forever changed when he sang, England is my city. But what few critics know is that Jake wrote that line and not Nick Crompton. This song was also picked apart for other segments mentioning the largest channel at the time. So whether it was Jake's intention or not, because of the song It's Every Day Bro, his name slowly started to spread through all avenues of YouTube and for the first time was being massively noticed and covered by other content creators, starting first with news channels, then eventually drifting towards commentary channels like PewDiePie, who was, at the time, the largest content creator on YouTube. PewDiePie's reaction video within the first month garnered 15 million views, which was a high amount even for a channel of his size his reaction video remaining as one of his most viewed videos ever. Because of this traction, other channels quickly caught on and began covering Jake Paul and his antics, working to give him more exposure. So with the success of this failure of this music video, he started mixing more music videos into his upload schedule, also claiming that Everyday Bro was a joke and should not be taken seriously. And I also want to like touch on the song that I made, It's Everyday Bro. There's been a lot of like backlash on the song, which is completely fine. Like haters are gonna hate, um, but I do want to just say like again, it's a joke. Like I'm not a rapper. PewDiePie has so much more clout than I do, and I know there's a lot of like people reacting to the video and like talking smack about it, and like that's totally fine. And I th I've seen some of the videos and I and I think they're funny. I don't know. I think that covers anything. And if anyone else says it was offended by the video or my actions in the past week, you know, I feel like I haven't myself. But other content creators believe that he was trying to save himself the embarrassment of admitting he created a terrible music track when he was actually trying to make a good music video. But Jake mostly brushed this off as hate has worked in his favor in the past to make him more money. Like how he promotes his merchandise as the better alternative to Logan Paul's merchandise making the purchase of Jake Paul's merchandise a personality choice for the young kids watching and showing off the merchandise at school, no different than something like a football jersey. And Jake knew that by creating this divide, it added identity to his clothing, so he was able to sell more to his younger audience. It was either you're a part of the Lo Gang or the Jake Paulers. A similar thing was happening to Ricegum, an established content creator that was known for his criticism of other creators and his diss tracks. The only difference was that Ricegum openly admits all of his videos are satire, and being that Jake Paul was now a hot commodity, on June 1st, Ricegum created a reaction video with Jake Paul's ex-girlfriend and employee, Alyssa Violet, showing a text of commitment she had towards Jake before he released the diss track insulting her. And then watch this. Yeah, I'm talking about you, you begging for attention, talking shit on Twitter too. And then you guys had like an argument on Twitter of you guys like just talking shit back and forth. Yeah. So that was about you? 100%. But you still hit my phone last night. It was 4.52 and Don't I... Don't tell me you texted him yesterday at 4.52. Hold on. Hold Is on. he talking about you again? No. You, you did text him. Yeah, I said I will always be here for you even if you don't want me to be. Yeah, and you're being nice to him. I was... This was then followed by a diss track by Ricegum, partially released on June 6th openly admitting everything is satire and that he doesn't care about the drama, he just wants the views. An older audience understood that this pattern of releasing diss tracks against each other and creating fake drama was an obvious and efficient way to get views. But a younger audience, with less social awareness, could easily be convinced that these two people hated each other. So Ricegum established himself as the anti-Jake Paul, transmuting all the hate that Jake Paul has accumulated to views and subscribers. But things got a bit serious when two days later on June 8th, Alyssa Violet talked about Jake and their pseudo relationship along with why she was kicked out that caused her a lot of psychological pain due to their close relationship when Jake would have access to multiple partners while she felt that she was exempt from that privilege. Every single guest that you had over had to be approved by Jake. Niels would always ask to have friends over, he's like, yeah, that's fine. But the second I asked to have like a guy over, he would be like, no, absolutely not. And I'd be like, why? He'd be like, I just don't want him here. But then he would have girls over like all the time in front of me. And then he would tell me all this stuff. He told me he loved me one night and then like, a couple days later he flew out 
this girl from Ohio. They were like hooking up in Ohio and he flew out this girl and was smashing her for like a week. That was like a few days after he told me he loved me. Are, are you serious? Like why would, how could you do that to someone? How could you just like, I don't even know. And like he knew exactly what he was doing to me. He like played all these mind games. He would literally tell me he loved me one day and then tell me he hates my guts the next day. Like I don't even know. Do you know what that does to a person that you like love and then you could just hear them like banging another girl upstairs and that's happened so many times like it's not something clicks in your head like you want to kill someone but you want to cry and you want to get revenge so to get revenge the person Lisa Violet slept with to get Jake jealous was none other than his brother Logan Paul I finally treated him the way that he was treating me and he didn't like it. He got pissed and kicked me out. Like the one time I decided to be savage like him and it ended with me being homeless. And he had the audacity to tell everyone that I cheated. I have no idea why, we were never together. There's literally a video of him saying that we're not dating, we're not together. But he told everyone that I cheated so it didn't, so he didn't look like a dick that he kicked me out. I don't know. I did everything. I did everything I could to try and make it work. I literally did everything I could. Everyone told me to just leave and I didn't I didn't want to leave. I I have no idea why I stayed. I have no idea. No idea. It should be noted that this was the reason she was kicked out and was given 30 days to move out before being forced out. Going back to their pseudo-relationship, around the start of 2017, Jake's fans would often pair them together as Jalissa. Though he openly denied a relationship, that did not stop him from constantly clickbaiting it, only adding more confusion to the mix. Back to June 9th, 2017, where everyone was discovering him at once and Jake was getting an immense amount of hatred, not just from Alyssa's video, but also tweets like this one where a victim of Jake Paul's public school bullying spoke out, him addressing both of these things in one video. These videos were hard to take seriously, as they were usually mixed in with a vlog and still included heavy advertising of his merchandise. Jake Paul writing this new wave of hatred did little to change his content at all. In fact, he practically embraced this image of one of YouTube's most disliked content creators. And as for Alyssa Violet and Jake Paul's falling out, Alyssa found companionship through Faze Banks, a friend of Ricegum's. But unlike much of the fake drama Jake entertains for gaining more views, his jealousy of Faze Banks and the relationship he had with Jake's ex was very real and would intensify as time went on. Possibly influenced by his jealousy, Jake started clickbaiting a relationship with Erica Costell, someone whom he met while at a business brunch for an app that Jake was working on. Though this relationship was fake at first, with videos of them attending a parody marriage ceremony and almost two weeks later getting a divorce, they'd later find themselves in a real relationship. But before the relationship evolved, Jake Paul faced his second wave of backlash for many reasons. Like pre-releasing his brother's diss track on him and not showing the full extent of footage as seen in the full music video that was released on Logan's channel. As the full music video that was released on Logan's channel was recorded a month ago when the drama with Alyssa Violet was happening and the ending of this diss track alluded to him making out with Jake's ex-girlfriend. So Jake's unwillingness to show this in his initial reaction showed that it really got to him. But what was actually newsworthy was a couple months prior to July of 2017, Jake Paul's address was accidentally leaked online when an employee of Team 10 was trying to set up a Team 10 business account on Google. But instead of inputting the information of an accountant or some other indirect way to access Team 10, the actual Team 10 address was put in, leaving it to eventually show up as a business. So if you were to type in Team 10 House on Google, you would find his address and a picture of his house. Jake and his company went as far as to hire several firms to attempt to scrub this from the internet, but to no avail, as it kept on getting reposted to the point where fans began showing up to his house, which complicated major disputes that he was having with his neighbors, because many of his neighbors were fed up with his loud and dangerous stunts. A prime example is when he nearly set his house on fire in November of 2016, when he threw furniture into his vacant swimming pool, poured lighter fluid on it, then set it on fire. Not anticipating the uncontrollable blaze to come, the fire department had to be called and further infuriated its surrounding neighbors. Now back to July, the fans and their parents constantly surround Jake's house, block traffic, took up parking, and screamed at the sight of Jake or any Team 10 member. 
On multiple occasions, the police were called, but could not arrest Jake as technically no laws were broken, which led neighbors to escalate by wanting to file a class action lawsuit against Jake Paul and his homeowner mostly due to these fans. These untamable fans were similarly symbolic to the uncontrollable pool fire that he had in his backyard, but instead of Jake Paul giving the narrative that it was out of his control, it was many news stations dominating popular opinion. Most famously was KTLA 5's coverage on the issue. It was their coverage that continued the second massive wave of hate towards Jake Paul. As throughout their packet, Jake Paul acted in what some would say is a disrespectful manner regarding the situation. Like climbing on top of the news van, running his dirt bike up and down the street with the intention to anger his neighbors, and specifically this segment of the news story. A lot of the neighbors are complaining, they're very upset. No, why? why? They say that you've created a living hell out here, uh, that it's like a circus. Yeah, it is. All the fans. I mean, but people stunts, like going to the, circuses, right? What do you say to the neighbors, though, that are upset? And they're uh, really no. upset. No, I, I honestly. You can't beat them, join them. No, I'm honestly, yeah, it's terrible. It's a bad situation. No, I feel bad for them, yeah. for sure. Uh, there's nothing we could do, though. The Jake Paulers are the strongest army out there, dab. I have one question for you. Yeah. What are those? <laughs> I guess he didn't like my shoes, but I don't think they're so bad. Jake Paul, with his size, was tarnishing the term YouTuber for most others on the platform. So to disassociate, many YouTube content creators, both large and small, began covering this new story as well, along with that previously mentioned video of Greg Paul kissing a much younger woman, most reacting to Jake's videos massively disapproving in his actions. Jake, a couple years later, defending his previous self, stating that he knew what reaction he would get when acting in such a foolish matter, and did so purposefully because he knew that it was his online persona, and thinking about business, wanted to get more publicity like what happened two months prior when he released It's Everyday Bro. But in this situation, it was getting a bit over his head. Like when he confronted a neighbor to try to apologize for his behavior, but secretly recorded the conversation and put it in one of his vlogs. The thing is, California has a two-party consent law. That means both parties must consent for their private conversations to be posted to the public. If there is no consent, like in this situation, the victim can file an eavesdropping complaint which can lead to jail time. The very same day that this vlog released, Jake Paul's Team 10 vehicle got into an accident when on the highway. Jake discussing it a day later him blaming his neighbors for this very dangerous act in front of millions of fans did not help his situation, as it made it seem like he was trying to direct fans to harass his neighbors through his star power. This was also something that was weakening. When he announced that he was leaving Bizarre Vark because he said it was difficult to balance running his business and be on a television show, and stated that the departure came from a mutual agreement. A spokesperson for Disney also saying, quote, We've mutually agreed that Jake Paul will leave his role on the Disney Channel series Bizarre Vark, unquote. But many people saw this as Jake wanting to retain his reputation as this separation happened mid-season of Bizarre Vark right when Jake was getting negative news coverage. But there was still much more to come. When popular musician Post Malone openly stated that he found Jake's music terrible and as a joke ordered Jake's merchandise and showed his order on Twitter. Jake Paul then received Post Malone's address from the merchandise distribution company because he wanted to hand deliver it himself. We thought we would hand deliver the merch, the merch to you. And we're hella confused because we're like, yo, we made a song and you dogged us, but like, we're like, yo, you got the merch, so. It's good man. You know, the merch is fire, so we're good. We <laughs> said so we're hella confused. Y'all want a beer? No, no, we're good. <laughs> You're good? You're good. Can we vlog or no? Sure, let's do it. And so we were like, yo, we gotta hand deliver him the merch. Thank you, sir. It's good stuff, right? You got some good stuff, man. It's like a god So, church, I, but right? I just, I, it's, like it's like a god church. I just need a little bit of explanation, because it's okay. like, you were kind of like iffy about the song, but right. we were like, but then you got the merch, so. Yeah, man, I just, you know, the merch is fire. You know I'm a clothes guy, so the, so the. I know, you got the, the aesthetic. Sweat, bro. You had the, the aesthetic going. Sweat. Thank you for repping. Yeah, Homies yeah, yeah. for life. Fellas. Keep on killing it. Turn up, boy. See you. That went so well. It, it went, it, it went really good. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's a fan. I think he, I think he likes us. And when Post Malone gave Jake Paul permission to vlog, he most likely did not know that he was also going to be doxxed. Or to have your private information, like a home address, available to the public as seen in Jake Paul's video, showing Post Malone's house and even license plates, bringing even more content creators to hate Jake Paul. 
This intense action was reciprocated by another intense action, when a presumably unstable viewer swatted Team 10 by making a false claim that someone in the Team 10 house was in danger, causing SWAT unit to evacuate everyone in the house. This happened three days in a row, and on the last day, it happened two times for a total of four. Two of the four were fire department when calls gave fake information saying the house was on fire. Seeing as this situation just kept evolving, Jake Paul announced he was moving, and started making repairs to the house, so things should have been better, but they absolutely were not. On August 2nd, 2017, on Twitter, hashtag JakePaulIsOverParty was number 3 trending in the United States. The reason was because of a vlog he released the day prior containing an interaction with a fan. Hi. Hi. Can you put this on vlog, please? Yes. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Kazakhstan originally, but... Oh. It sounds like you're just gonna blow someone up. Thank you so much. You're like, send the nuke! Were you making a prank over there? Yeah, we... Yeah, bro, can I just take a picture of it? Yeah, let's do it, bro. Many claimed that this interaction was racist, and some did a bit of a deep dive into Jake Paul's Twitter and found several tweets where he was using words that are widely considered taboo. In an attempt to mend his image, he released a music video discussing all the good things he's done and asking why it's not being covered, like preparing Thanksgiving meals for the less fortunate, handing out free backpacks for those who can't afford it, or just two days prior to this music video, fulfilling a make-a-wish request. This music video did little to win anyone over to his side, except for his audience of young kids and teens, when on August 14th, Jake Paul was nominated for Choice Web Star in the category of Music and Best YouTuber. He won both categories. This decision to provide him with an award during the heat of these controversies infuriated many, but not as much as what happened next. When in a rather serious turn of events, Meg Zelly, the now ex-assistant of Jake Paul, made an accusation that Faze Banks, the person who was dating Jake Paul's much-coveted ex, as claimed by Meg Zelly, was clotheslined by him and left a very visible bruise on her neck. She also accused Banks of cheating. To oversimplify things, after a lot of back and forth from both parties, Jake deleted the video of the accusations, which he didn't even do for the video of where he started a fire or when he docks Post Malone. This video made Jake Paul lose around 80,000 subscribers in one day, while Banks gained around 200,000. With Banks' testimony, along with the testimony of Max, an ex-member of Team 10, who has known Meg for seven years at the time, defended Banks, and stated that he wasn't sure why she started this drama, and later caused the firing of Meg as Jake's assistant. Now, the club, Warwick, yeah. alright? They're, the owner and the management yeah. there have sifted through these security films, or security tapes, and they yeah. have not seen any, any proof at all from beginning to end, following Banks through the club, following Megs through the club. They didn't see any altercation between the two of them. Um, I, I, Bro, this is... Go ahead. Just, <laughs> I don't know why she would do this. Like, it's... It kills me as her best friend, like why she would put herself through this. Like, it, like she told me that night she knew it was an accident. She told me she knew it was an accident. Even if any, like I don't even. So much of it was not what she expressed to me that night. That it it kills me because I I love this girl. She's like a family member to me, and I I hate that I have to to come out and do this. But that is not what she said went down that night, and I'm not surprised that the security footage is not showing that. Since both parties decided to settle this mostly privately, the narrative that Banks is innocent is what holds, making Jake Paul take another loss, and soon taking another one, when, because of his many fines and reckless activity at his house, it was revealed that he was no longer allowed to film there without a valid filming permit, or risk facing up to six months in prison. At this point, Jake had gone through some extremely negative public relations, and his image was falling to unrecoverable depths so he needed a PR campaign to win back the many fans that he had lost. This was around the same time that Hurricane Harvey hit Louisiana and Texas. Jake jumping on this opportunity by announcing that he was directly going down to Texas to help the victims of the hurricane in whatever way he could, starting a GoFundMe and making exclusive merchandise where 100% of the proceeds would go towards victims of Hurricane Harvey. But unable to break from his disastrous cycle, initially this turned into yet another mess when he announced that he would meet fans at a Walmart parking lot where two U-Hauls would be waiting for them to take items like water in order to be transported to the victims of the hurricane. On paper, this sounds like a decent plan, 
but in execution, it probably could not have gone worse than it did. For starters, when Jake Paul arrived at the Walmart, hundreds of unorganized fans were waiting for him. The second he was noticed, even before entering the Walmart parking lot, fans and parents flocked to his truck. Though there were many people that had purchased supplies to be donated, it was hard for them to reach the U-Hauls as throughout the evening, the more impatient fans were piling on his truck and jet skis, taking after his example. Jake maintaining a steady speed to wade through the crowd meant that at some points, fans were falling off his vehicle, and it is rumored some fans were injured by getting trampled in the crowd or getting their limbs run over. Also, having this many people in one place without proper security meant that fights broke out amongst fans, and several police units had to be called over to control the situation. This caused Jake to get on top of his truck to scream in disappointment at his disorganized fans. Guys, we're here to help Hurricane Harvey. You guys are acting like animals. Everyone calm down. This isn't, we're not here for a meet and greet. We're here to get supplies to the people in Hurricane Harvey. How are we? How are we gonna help them if you guys are just bombarding and like punching back up. each other? Back True. Like, we're here to get supplies into the U-Haul truck. You guys see U-Haul trucks? I can go. No, I don't. Where are they? <laughs> but things did eventually die down a bit, and a fair amount of supplies were donated through these U-Hauls. But other channels more critical of Jake broke down this event a bit more financially. Keemstar suggesting that these supplies only amounted to around a total of $3,000, and saying that this event could have been executed in many better ways, like calling the Walmart beforehand and having it loaded without a swarm of fans blocking progression. Or he could have simply donated the money the vlog made, which was around an estimated ten dollars to $15,000 if monetized. Another issue with this event is that many attendees could not make their way through the crowds to donate their supplies but Jay claimed him and other volunteers would take additional supplies than the ones shown in his vlog. His vlog the following day had a very different feeling. It was not just the tone of the video, but Jake Paul as well. He was not his usual high energy self, but his calmer off-camera self that he usually reserves for interviews rarely seen by fans. Throughout this video, Jake is seen rescuing civilians held by the flood waters. Though few critics, like in other situations he's been involved in, pointed out that he was doing this to mend his public image, and though that might be the case, he did help people that were in need, not only doing smaller things like rescuing pets, but also raising the morale of victims to this hurricane that lost much because of it, providing an emotional uplift that in a time like this was much needed. On the financial side, he raised $150,000 and also gave a lot of exposure to this disaster and helped encourage many unaccounted donations. And just three days after returning home, Jake Paul got his 10 million subscriber plaque. Quite a monumental achievement considering just one year ago he was at 250,000 subscribers. Even crazier, in some months around the middle of 2017, Jake Paul was getting around half a billion views per month. These are the most views he'd ever receive on YouTube. As the year went on and he experienced less controversies, he saw a decline in both views and subscribers gained but still getting a phenomenal amount of traction nonetheless. Introducing more drama into his vlogs that dealt with Ricegum and his companions. This back and forth between the two did well to grow both of their channels. Jake even got a role in a YouTube Red original series known as Fight of the Living Dead, where several competitors competed in a story and challenge-driven series. Jake on his channel adding even more aspects to his vlog, like his new mansion that was now hosting Team 10 and other, well, younger initiates of Team 10, like mini Jake Paul, a child talent that was most likely used to reach the young members of Jake Paul's demographic and also promote his merchandise to them. He also had a space for a bit of an older demographic, when he collaborated with famous musicians like Gucci Mane on a remix of It's Every Day Bro and 21 Savage for a ride-along in Jake's Tesla. But it is rumored that Jake had to pay in six figures in order to get these collaborations done. Though Jake claims, for Gucci Mane, it was because his daughter is a massive fan of Jake. But viewers still don't believe him, as they believe these rappers most likely would not want to associate with his volatile persona without some financial incentive. Others shared this commonality when the Martinez twins left Team 10. But unlike most other members that went somewhat unnoticed when leaving, the Martinez twins made a video talking about Jake Paul and what they had to endure while living with him saying that they were victims of his constant pranks, 
racism, not having access to their money, and being coerced by Jake Paul into performing sexually themed acts on each other for his vlog. And so why we have to do that? I don't, I don't care. I, and I was like, no, no, I don't want to do it. Because when you don't do something that he wants to do, to do, like he you wants to, do to it. say, like he's like, you need to do that. And if you don't do it, he's like, you're because he's like the boss of Team 10. This video got 4 million views after one week's time, and did two things. Painted an even worse picture of Jake Paul by adding to a list of accusations against him, and secondly, opening the floodgates as it slowly but surely encouraged more members to leave as well. Some are still skeptical about the Martinez Twins video, as Nick Crompton later stated that all pranks were pre-planned and had everyone in on it including the destruction of a decoy room the Martinez twins claim to be the real room. Overall, many are trusting of most of their accusations, as it is not the first time that Jake Paul has been accused of doing something similar. But it's safe to assume his army of younger viewers cared very little, and were more interested in watching his new Christmas-themed music video, constructed dramas, and mostly pre-planned pranks and stunts both ending and marking 2017 as Jake Paul's most prosperous year on YouTube, making a viral impact practically no other American creator made that year. Considering that much of the smaller dramas of 2017 were skipped over for the sake of brevity, there was still an extreme amount to cover for a single year, showing that a 20-year-old Jake Paul, that along with making over $50 million in 2017, demonstrated that he had a clear talent of knowing how to catch the attention of not only his younger target audience, but also the much older demographic that shunned him. And shunned they did, some wrongly when they confused him for his older brother, Logan Paul, as Logan got into possibly the biggest controversy that he'd ever been involved in. When visiting a forest in Japan infamous for its high suicide rates, he, as the forest entails, found a corpse, recorded it and his reaction to it, then uploaded it for millions of viewers to see. But it doesn't stop there. This video also made it to the trending page, starting a massive scandal for Logan Paul. And because he is the brother of Jake Paul and their content at times can feel interchangeable, some brands that work with Jake no longer wanted to be associated with either of them. This was demonstrated when Jake lost a brand deal in the millions of dollars. It didn't help that also at the beginning of 2018, Jake Paul was criticized for uploading a video titled, I Lost My Virginity, with a very lewd thumbnail to accompany it. This video had to be age-restricted by YouTube. Also still in January, TMZ uploaded a video of Jake using racial slurs while rapping. But by a month's time, in the beginning of February, focus was shifted to KSI a large YouTube content creator with about 17.7 million subscribers at the time. KSI is well known for things such as diss tracks, gaming, and reaction videos whom after winning a boxing match called out the Pauls live saying that he's willing to fight either of them. Wow. <laughs> Obviously, man's got this belt right now. If any YouTuber wants it, you can come get it. Jake Paul! Jake Paul! Logan Paul! Any of the polls, I don't care. Bring it. Whether this was planned or it was from the adrenaline from the boxing match, challenging the polls, especially when they were so hated, would work perfectly to grow anyone's channel. So this potential fight acted like a sort of long-form collaboration. By working against each other, their brands would be echoed and discussed by various other channels witnessing these YouTube titans compete. Once this challenge was received by Jake and Logan, Jake immediately deflected by saying that his father is also a Paul and that KSI should be willing to fight him. KSI KFC, if you're watching this, I'm giving you two options. You can fight my dad in Cleveland, Ohio, only MMA style, and we can do, we can do it whenever. Option two, fight mini Jake Paul. <laughs> in a boxing match. You're not ready for the heat, bro. This is like Ohio, I'm warning you, like I don't even need to warn you, but Ohio just does things differently. But because of Jake's hesitance to fight, his video received a massive amount of dislikes and mostly served to promote KSI. After a series of back and forth on their social medias, Deji, the younger brother of KSI, also entered the drama. And things started to match up perfectly when Deji insulted Jake, which led to Jake confronting Deji in the wild with boxing gloves. Deji then declined to fight, citing that it was absurd for it to happen without a prior agreement and training also stating that he was recovering from tonsillitis. This further setting the idea of a family versus family fight. 
the seniors, KSI and Logan, and the juniors, Deji and Jake, where they confirmed a boxing match late February, having it later scheduled for August 25th, 2018. But also coming in late February was an announcement that he was taking a break from his daily vlogs after filming them nearly every day for around 500 days in a row. Jake saying that it was because he needed to help certain people, not disclosing whom or how he was going to help. This break lasted for two weeks. His return came with a non-monetized, meaning that Jake did not intend to make a profit off it, mini documentary about the recent Parkland shooting, where he interviewed Florida Senator Marco Rubio, along with the students involved in the shooting, and listened to their harrowing stories. While the students and the subject matter were approved unanimously by viewers and content creators alike as it helped promote awareness to Jake's young audience, having Jake Paul as the core interviewer and the person guiding the documentary made it odd when he asked for gun reforms, as on multiple occasions prior to the creation of the documentary, he's been seen promoting weaponry. And not just through his videos where he uses guns in what some would consider a reckless manner, but also branded himself with a tattoo of a gun on his leg. In this documentary, he'd also state that this trip changed his life. But even more recently, as we'll see later in the video, he still treats guns like decor. It wasn't just the viewers challenging his decisions, but also members of Team 10. When Jake Paul brought on his father, Greg Paul, to live with him and run Team Dunn. Greg Paul, wanting to have as little expenditures as possible within the company, fired many employees that Nick Crompton vetted and worked with, which is why he walked out. Not only that, but Greg Paul has an extremely poor track record online for being hypermasculine and not getting a good hold on social media in comparison to his two sons or even his ex-wife. This mixed in with his vulgarity both on and off camera creates an unpleasant work environment. With rumors of him constantly berating the other members of Team 10, even Jake's longtime friend, Chan Sutton, was one of the ones leaving, possibly in connection to Greg Paul or videos showcasing a switch that both Chance and Anthony were making towards gaming content. With Jay constantly harassing them, wanting to focus on more outdoor activities. Chance and Anthony, our music video came out, the like, the 12 Days of Christmas music video, it's pretty dope, have you guys seen it yet? Okay, time to fix the problem. All right, there's, I think there was a spot there. No, you're an idiot, bro. Your attention is unplugging your game. What's up, dude? You wanna hang out? No, I want a game. Hey! <laughs> we gotta do stuff! Game at night. When it's daylight, go outside and see the sun. The sun's out? Yeah, I wouldn't know. These videos can be discounted as scripted pranks, but Chance's serious move towards gaming makes Jake's bothersome antics a bit more real. This domino effect, starting with Greg Paul, created another issue. Because Jake was planning to go on tour with Team 10 to perform in front of his fans, though the departed members seemed to be absent from a promotional poster of the tour the same day he discussed the massive departures. So Jake still went on tour with the remaining members of Team 10. In the heat of this drama, Jake uploaded My Teachers, which as the description says, is a diss track against teachers. This video was hated for many, many reasons like how many consider teachers to be underpaid, but yet work an important job educating America's youth. Also reasons like nonsensical lines like, my teachers never taught me that, how to buy a Lambo cash, which for many people is not an essential life skill. It should be noted that Jake did have somewhat of a poor high school experience with him getting shunned by his upperclassmen and teachers, which could have very well brought on this video. A larger grievance for some was that because his audience consists largely of children, he was, again, setting a bad example for them. In fact, many of the videos created within this time were the target of a scandal dealing with how Jake Paul markets to his younger audience, which would be fully fleshed out a couple months ahead. In the meantime, busy with touring and training for his boxy match, Jake Paul's daily vlogs weren't so daily as it was now common for him to miss a couple days of uploads, with his training taking much of a priority. Jake was so confident in his skill, he constantly claimed that he would knock out Deji before the first round ended. I, yeah, I, don't, I think we just like all started talking trash online, and then 
I didn't even know KSI had a little brother, um, which is which is pretty embarrassing for you. You got such a meathead, you know. Yeah. You got such a meathead. That's I, I, I didn't realize. And your nose is a lot more crooked. Yeah, that's so. That's nuts. Does that make you feel good about yourself? Yeah. Cool. Come on. Um, anyways, as I was saying, uh, yeah. So then I didn't know he KSI had a little brother, and uh, he makes a video calling me a, a pussy like 50 times <laughs> and yeah like he's, he's the only one you that are, laughs you are a pussy though he's the only one that laughs at his jokes pussy. i've also been to uh what do you call it wwe as well you know it's fake so i'm pretty sure you're you know that's like kind of like you just the fake persona mm. but we're gonna know august 25th like how serious you really are and you'll know how serious i am too yeah explain the fight to me round one round one I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> give me something. Give me something. Give you something. Um, why, why are you scared to give away I, too much? I just thought I just want to give away like what my plan is. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to knock you out with the right hook. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Right now. All right. I can't wait. So tell me your game plan. Well, wait and see. He's talking right out first round. No, no, that's good. I know. He's uh, even said it in videos that he wants to knock me out in the first round. And like I said, I'm going to hold you to it. First round. This claim was put to the test on August 25th, 2018, the day of the fight, which was located in Deji's home country, England. Viewers could watch this fight live through a channel established purely to host the fight, but access to the live feed, much to viewers' dismay, cost $10. Or alternatively, viewers could catch a live stream streaming the live stream. While YouTube was keen on banning channels streaming the fight, Twitch was very much not with a boxing category of Twitch packed with streams of the fight. And actually, more people watch for free on Twitch than on the official pay-per-view livestream. During the fight, the crowd was heavily in Deji's favor, constantly chanting his name either because he was naturally more favorable or that the fight did take place in his home country. While Deji did receive more support than Jake, the open belief was that due to Jake's athleticism, Deji would not stand a chance, but they were proven wrong with the first round ending with Jake's face bloodied due to a punch to his nose and that Jake was naturally a bleeder. Many now watched intensely, as it visibly seemed like Deji had the upper hand, but as the fight progressed and heavily tested the fighter's cardio, Deji became more defensive and increasingly resorted to clinching. He was also often backed to the side of the rings or into the corners. Though that does not discount the many good hits landed by Deji, Jake just landed them more accurately and more offensively. By round 5 of a 6 fight match, both fighters were breathing heavily, the floor littered red with Jake's blood and glitter from Deji's boxing shorts, Jake backing Deji into a corner and wailing on him. With Deji struggling to get out of Jake's consistent yet powerful blows, the towel was thrown in. Jake had won the boxing match by a technical knockout. This was a much needed win for Jake, as 2018 for him admittedly was superficially successful. Successful, but horrible for his mental health. With close friends leaving him, being hated on an extremely large scale, and unknown to most, being involved in several lawsuits, some of which were brought up by strangers that fell victim to his vlogged antics. This event, including KSI and Logan Paul's fight, made an estimated $11 million according to Business Insider. Jake most likely not taking a larger percentage of that due to this being his first YouTube boxing match and was very experimental, with much of the money going back into expenses and being split by YouTube and all the talents. But this trial was a success. It showed that the combined power of large internet celebrities over the course of several months could form a large interest. Not only on YouTube where the fight was discussed by people far from Jake's community, but also viewers willing to fill an arena and watch the fight in person. So with this victory, Jake was hooked, and anticipated more fights to come. Though interestingly enough, this victory was short-lived, as it foreshadowed his next scandal when at the beginning of the fight, he promoted new merchandise which was immediately booed by the crowd.
This was very symbolic in a way. As it was, at a larger scale, what viewers were going to think of Jake come September 1st, 2018, when Nerd City, a channel known for making extremely high quality, long form, analytical content, released Parents Worst Nightmare, Jake Paul, and broke down exactly how Jake Paul markets to his younger audience, and why, if following television broadcasting laws, should not be legal. The law does several things that are intended to stop scumbags like the Pauls from exploiting younger viewers. The CTA dictates that shows may not include commercials for products related to the program or featuring characters from the program, which is called host selling. It also limited how many minutes per hour of commercials that children's programming can contain. That's 17.5% and 20% of the watch time maximum can be ads. Now let's store those numbers right here because we're gonna need them in a minute when we check out Jake Paul's content. Out of a 13 minute and 50 second video, nearly seven minutes of that time is devoted to advertising products, 50%. Now, remember our numbers here, 17.5% and 20%. And Jake understands and leans into heavy repetition as a principle of advertising. Aside from what some would consider the immoral aspects of Jake Paul's content, like having young representatives market his merchandise to his young audience, extending as far as cartoon characters, immoral actions like showcasing sexualized thumbnails to his young audience that was also backed by Jake's parents. His parents both have a history of frankly difficult to watch sexualized acts in front of their children. Immoral actions like Jake's fictional miniseries where he and other members of Team 10 were invaded by killer clowns that threatened Jake and friends, going as far as to change the name of Jake Paul's channel to Jake Paul Will Die, distressing his audience and led to the reactionary videos showing their serious concern as they are mentally unable to perceive that Jake was in no real harm. So aside from all of that, Jake in a fair portion of his videos frequently promotes merchandise, events, and other types of promotions, leading to him at times selling over $1 million of merchandise a day, sometimes back to back to back to back, as quoted from Jake Paul. This I'll do because of his aggressive advertising of his merchandise, which if it were on television, due to the 1990s Children's Television Act, would be widely limited as explained by Nerd City, a 17.5% and 20% maximum of content targeted towards children can be advertisements. While Jake's promotion-packed videos are split clean in half of actual content and content created to advertise to children. His merchandise was further criticized by Nerd City and revealed it to be uncreative schlock that heavily utilized clip art and other existing designs. I isolated the graphics in his hideous looking fashion line, reverse image searched them, and got a bunch of hits. He says he's a fashion designer. No, he's catfishing the public with this merch. This wave design, this Lamborghini, this goat, these boxing gloves, the logo for his entire line. The God Church, even. All clip art. Rise, rise and be original. That's my saying, you guys. Fight like a champion, be original. This video made quite the impact. Not really on Jake's established viewer base, but more so on the channels and viewers that already had existing grievances with Jake Paul and what he represents making his boxing victory short-lived, as his advertising techniques took the spotlight, which again shifted towards an eight-part series that the large YouTube documentarian Shane Dawson began releasing on Jake Paul, with the premise to find out if he is a sociopath or not. But looking at Shane's previous subjects, many took note that Shane Dawson is generally known for giving controversial figures a clean slate and allowed them to get over or avoid some of their scandalous activities. Though Shane denies that his intentions were to clear Jake's name, this series mostly did just that, and on an insanely wide scale, with each video on Jake Paul constantly getting over 10 million views within the first week of release, leading to Jake and Shane to trend on Twitter and YouTube. While this series did start off slow in the beginning, as the first few episodes did not even include Jake Paul in person, and there were controversies about how some ideas were handled, with Shane having a reputable name at the time meant that his videos, which were quite high in quality, formatting, and research, received overwhelming support. This series helped clear a lot of things up for Jake Paul, 
because as he stated, he avoided addressing much drama on his channel because it would be difficult to believe it from him due to all the hate he was getting. But if this drama was explained on Shane's channel, which it was, his claims might receive fair judgment. Like how his pranks are lightly scripted and most victims received fair warning in order to confirm their participation. This is like the... I, I feel like it'll, it fixes a lot of problems, especially some of the big problems where people just think something that's not true. You couldn't breathe? No. I feel like pretty much everyone that's a little bit older knows that it's all fake. It's all over! It's just difficult to say that the fake when there's still loads of young kids watching and enjoying it and I don't know if I don't want to be responsible for ruining that whole thing. Or how Lissa and Jake never officially dated and how he gave her 30 days plus to move out after she had slept with his brother as an act of revenge. This specific situation and Jake's difficult recounting of it along with how much it hurt him was something that helped people reach Jake with empathy. And that was like her way of like hurting me and like getting revenge for the way that I hurt her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if like... And so, so I, I'm literally like sitting in uh, on, like on the couch like this one night and my friend comes up to me and is like, hey man, like, I've been kind of like putting clues together, but like, someone needs to tell you. Um, and like Nick was standing right there and, and uh, the person who was telling me and I was just like, yeah, all right, what's going on? And he was just like, Alyssa and your brother uh, have been having sex. Uh, and uh, I didn't like. I don't even know what I did. Um, like my mind was going like a million miles per hour, and um, it kind of like immediately, like without asking him why he thought that or like what the clues were how they even found that out I was like yeah like that makes like it all makes sense now like I could totally see that um and I, I was shocked I didn't know how to react I I think I like uh I was just like heartbroken I was, for many reasons. I was like, yeah, how could like, like, why would my brother do this? It was like one of my first thoughts. Um, and reg I, I think like, yes, like in our fucked up relationship, like we did a lot of messed up things to hurt each other. But like that to me was like, just like that was it for me. I was like, I don't, I can't, I don't want to look at this girl. I don't, I can't believe this. Like, I, I don't even really want to like talk to her. Um, and so I stayed silent for like three days and And, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I should, I don't know, I don't know if I need to, like, go into any more detail, really. On the last episode of Shane's series, Jake is not portraying himself as a high-energy, careless stuntman that appeals to children, as he does on his channel, but a calm, hurt, reachable victim that showed his unfortunate experiences with the destructive events he created and is hated for. 
allowing him to acknowledge flaws and make him more relatable to an older audience. It also marked him as a product of Yes Men, and having a childlike mentality whom is incapable of understanding some of his scandals as portrayed by Shane Dawson. Like his most recent scandal with his aggressive targeted advertisements towards his audience which he heavily defended at the time. This series finale, like other entries of the series, landed on the number one spot on YouTube trending and ended the series with the hope that Jake's now serious girlfriend, Erica Costell, would help mold him into a better person, effectively giving Jake a chance at a clean slate, as he was now being viewed mostly in a positive light. But critics pointed out how Jake changes his motives depending on who he's addressing about his merchandise. If it's a businessman, he'll gloat at the power of influencers and how he sells his merchandise. But if it's something that he knows his audience will watch, he'll act like an ignorant fool, saying he creates merch to make people happy. As described by an additional Nerd City video released 10 days after the ending of Shane's series. You shouldn't have lit your backyard on fire. Okay, maybe that was crazy. You shouldn't have insulted teachers. Yeah, like, and that's yeah, the truth about yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the moment that you're challenged on something that could actually impact your income, you dismiss it completely. People are trying to say, like, I'm just doing it to manipulate and try to make money off of kids, like, shut the fuck up. I think, it, I honestly, I think it's fucking stupid that people think that's manipulative. For people to say that I'm, like, trying to manipulate younger kids is, is, it's like, it's ridiculous. The core tenet of Jake Paul's empire is exploiting children with aggressive advertising. Acknowledging that could hurt his wallet, though. So he called that ridiculous. If children aren't asking their parents to buy your merch, then who are they asking and why is it selling so well? Go tell your mama, she gotta buy it all. This was a really poor response because it left only two possibilities. One, you don't understand how advertising works, which would make you really dumb and you're not. Or two, you do understand how advertising works and you're lying. You're lying. The point you made about commercial breaks in SpongeBob SquarePants forced Shane Dawson to explain to you the power of influencer marketing. But isn't there like commercials in between SpongeBob? Yeah, but it's not SpongeBob. You're the one that the kid trusts and loves and looks up to and wants to be. But you don't act so dumb when you're talking to businessmen, do you? I kind of like saw the value in influencers and like how much power we had and like I realized with this much power, why don't I create and own the pie uh, instead of promoting someone else's pie? Those clips from your fundraising days are several years old, which means that you've understood influencer marketing for several years now. Also, Jay continued to upload sexualized thumbnails like Quick! or videos that are possibly traumatizing to a younger audience like his continuation of the Attack of the Killer Clown series. Additionally, less than a month later, the bastion of hope that Shane Dawson had set up as Erica Costell dissolved, when on November 7th, Jake tweeted that he and Erica had broken up, presumably right after the Shane Dawson series. This breakup was also the centerpiece to Jake's new series, Jake Paul Uncut, where he took a more relaxed, genuine, and less promotive approach to his content. A perfect fit to follow up on the older audience Shane gave to him through a series. I want Jake Paul Uncut to be that authentic, real piece of content on YouTube. I, I want it to like really, really connect with y'all. I'm personally tired of a lot of the content on YouTube. It feels so forced. What are you most afraid of about this series? I think people misunderstanding why I'm doing it and my intentions behind it. Uh, I think there's already been some feedback about me like exploiting certain things like just to get views. Uh, specifically the situation and the, the most recent thing that happened with Erica and us breaking up. No, honey. Uh, our relationship started on camera. Literally the whole entire thing has been on camera. I'm not exploiting anything to make money, to make views. Uh, th there's like swearing, there's cursing in this. I don't even know if this is this type of content is going to be uh, monetizable. Did Shane Dawson have any influence on this series? Yes, a lot. He made me realize that I need to open up more and be honest and real. It helped me so much to grow as a person. I'm tired of like faking everything, hiding everything, pushing everything down. And um, that's what I did before. And it, it ended up with me being in a weird, bad place in my life. And uh, I'm just going to put it out there and be more open and, and truthful and show my mistakes and things like that. 
Though it was well received, Jake Paul and Cut did not make it past two episodes, possibly because he could make more by advertising to his established young audience, like when he promoted a now defunct gambling site known as mysterybrand.net. This site was promoted by various other content creators like Ricegum, showing themselves winning prizes with seemingly unrealistic odds, easily making a profit on most of their gamblings. Presumably because their accounts had increased odds of winning in order to improve the confidence in the viewer to access the gambling site. Sure, there were problems with the website, like some odds seemed skewed and some prizes offered were not even property of the gambling site. The larger issue was realized when people noticed the content creators that the website reached out to had audiences that mostly derived of children. No, I do know my audience because there's like back-end analytics right. and like they it's, break it down for you. Yeah, and like I know their age, age range, I know mm -hmm. where they're from, I know where they live. So who's the audience? Like who do you talk? It's like I'm talking like eight to fifteen year olds is like my core audience. Mm -hmm. So Jake Paul was knowingly and directly promoting an addictive gambling site to children. This became his first scandal of 2019, continuing the tradition of involving himself in questionable positions. But not all of these needed to be scandalous. Something that he began conflicting with was who exactly he wanted to make videos directed towards, as he was now seriously getting into music and furthering his boxing career by training and looking for potential opponents. So he noticed that he was gaining a bit of an older following as well that was more interested in the genuine side of Jake Paul rather than the show he puts on for children. This can be seen on a video titled Dear YouTube, I have been hiding this from you posted on February 11th, 2019. In this video, Jake states why he stopped making Jake Paul uncut. The reason was because while Jake was trying to show a more genuine side of him and show his non-scripted, genuine private life, those around him that were also in the recording were uncomfortable with being shown out of character and asked Jake not to continue the series, so Jake complied. Regardless, he was still taking steps to further grow his adult audience, reminding his viewers that Jake became an internet celebrity at just 16 years old and began a business with a million dollar investment at 18 when most of his peers were barely graduating high school. So at the time, this conflict within him persisted and possibly birth Team 10 Uncut, a sort of spin-off of Jake Paul Uncut where it was framed in the style of a reality TV show. Only at this point, all of the original members of Team 10 had already left. Naturally, a show of this style would have an older viewer base, which was possibly Jake's compromise for making content for his older viewer base, kicking it off with some star power when it was revealed that Tana Mojo, a content creator that was also the subject of a Shane Dawson documentary, had been sleeping with Jake after a breakup with her ex, and Jake used this revelation to clickbait their developing relationship eventually proposing to her on June 24th, 2019, which was her 21st birthday. And a month later in June, had a superficial marriage ceremony as there was no marriage license and it wasn't actually officiated by someone that had the ability to do so. It also seemed that Jake's viewership was going down steeply during this time, a trend that has been continuous since his peak in mid-2017 but this can largely be attributed to his lack of daily uploads, as the videos he posted during this time had similar viewership to those of 2017. He was simply uploading less, but the money was still coming in. A prime example was his fake wedding, which was livestreamed, but in order to watch this livestream, you had to pay $50 to get what was claimed to be the optimal view, Jake earning over a million dollars through this livestream alone but that was before refunds started coming in. As fans were furious at the quality of the livestream, which was at times choppy, had poor angles, had people constantly walking in front of the shot, and had many other areas where it lacked in the quality expected for $50. Also neglected was Tana after the wedding, as Jake was being set up to fight an Isung Gib, which is Big Nose NA backwards, someone that was heavily promoted by KSI and won the popular vote for who Jake should find next. This fight was meant to be Jake's professional boxing debut, Jake taking it so serious he began training in high altitude and learning to control his adrenaline in cold waters. This intense training came at a price, when he admitted he fell out of love with Tana and in love with boxing, which led to their separation. That and, Jake was not only transitioning content-wise with trying to make more competent music by taking singing lessons and trying to refine his craft, 
but also in his appearance, as he now had a beard and was usually equipped with a pair of earrings, which was a new image for a new year. The start of 2020, winning the fight against Gibb by TKO, first round, 2 minutes and 18 seconds. This quick win possibly gave more confidence to his new persona. A persona that had been a bit more relaxed with what he shows on camera. Not afraid to bring on adult actresses, title thumbnails rated R, or to show himself smoking marijuana. Some saying this seems like a depressive episode, others saying he's just being more of himself. Even though he was transitioning to a new Jake Paul, his old actions still came back to haunt him. One popular content creator Drew Gooden unearthed Edfluence. A sort of educational course of how to become an influencer launched by Jake Paul, costing $7 to unlock the service. Or so it seemed. To unlock all the content of Edfluence cost an additional $57. $57 to access low effort basic information that Jake Paul was preaching, and to join something called Team 1000, which was a take on Team 10. But as we return to 2020, this site is offline, and with no mention of what Team 1000 is or was. Not learning from this venture, in February of 2020, Jake Paul promoted the Financial Freedom Movement, a subscription based service that cost $20 a month. That while Jake acted like the spokesperson, actually included lessons from other entrepreneurs. And by the making of this video, like Influence, the financial freedom movement is non-existent. Jake Paul, yet again, demonstrating to many that he will choose money over his fanbase and the morals they hold. Him now arguing that his fanbase is now 18 to 24 years old. A demographic that is harder to take advantage of monetarily. Which, to reiterate, his content now accurately reflects. This still not stopping critics from both sides, as some state that he is making adult content for children, while also insinuating that he should continue making videos that appeal to children, though those are the kind of videos that continually get him into trouble and are the origin of his possibly illegal advertising practices. But even to his older audience, many claim Jake Paul is still not a good role model. In 2020 alone, he has been seen seemingly looting during a riot where he was actually just charged with trespassing, held parties during a widespread pandemic, and even had his house raided in connection to the trespassing where several guns were found scattered throughout his home, which only enforces the negative view that people set upon him. A negative view that has existed since his online inception, something he established when he was just a teenager at 16. Jake Paul is an extremely hard worker, and intelligent in business, becoming a self-made millionaire before he hit his 20s. Normally, such an achievement would be the top of someone's description, especially considering the unknown, intense stressings that come with running a business, and having actual lies being made about him with no way to defend himself, all handled and absorbed at 23. A true testament to his work ethic and dedication that is almost unrivaled by anyone else on YouTube. I'm talking about like hour long phone calls, multiple times a week, depositions, interrogations. Shut the fuck up. I didn't even know this. We hear we hear about some of it. I didn't know it was this bad. Depositions, dude? Yeah. yeah. Uh lawyer calls to talk about the depositions. Oh my god. Emails, yeah. uh evidence finding evidence. So I have to like go back into like old shit. Like it's it's a but there's fucking more nightmare. than just that too, though, no, right? Well, what else? Like, no, that, 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 that was, there's way more than that. I was about to say, he just scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, and just like being in like a fucking, like I win the fight, right? Like I trained five months. That was my sole focus and purpose. And I par like win, party, like have a good time, like turning the fuck up, like with all my fucking best friends. And then all of a sudden I get back to LA, I'm by myself. My girl's not there. I'm si like sitting in the fucking room and I'm like, what, like, what do I do? <laughs> like, I don't even know who I like, what is Jake Paul right now? And like, where is this path? And like, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm looking at my house. Like this is like, I live here. Like, this is my home. Like everything was just like weird foreign soil territory. Like I didn't, Cause you hadn't been there in months. Hadn't been there in months. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, just like all of this, all these like thoughts, it also coming down from the, uh, the high I just had, like 
the ultimate of highs coming down from like like I after I drink a lot like days in a row yep. I come down with like anxiety so like on this like huge come down and like at a weird place in my life where like I'm 23 uh and it's like what do I want out of this life and like I just had a, like started having like super like deep thoughts and then that's when I was like yo guys I need to come talk to you uh and like just i talked to his friends that's what it was did like, that, help, I did did that, that help you yes yes so much um sorry i'm getting like a little teary eyed <laughs> but uh yeah and then i wake up the next day and like have a uh a phone call like with my lawyers for one of the lawsuits and i knew that it was going to be like a big L <laughs> and it, like, I'm just sitting on the phone call for literally like, like something I did not do. Like it's, it's, and it goes back to like people just like attacking Jake Paul and like wanting to see me fail <laughs> for literally like fucking nothing. Like, like they're suing me for something I didn't do like on God. It's just the most bullshit thing. And I literally had to pay them a lot of fucking money for no reason. And I'm, and I'm like, it just pisses me the fuck off. And then. You're good. Take a break. Take a break. Yeah, take, take a breather. Take, take we, a breather. We can sit for a second. To close, Jake Paul is in a complicated situation where he is moderately used as an example of a sellout. And even though there are many accounts, if not an extremely high majority of all of his interactions off camera, have people loving his personality and saying he is a very pleasant, kind, and considerate person. But online, people force him to stay in a ring of hated creators as a deterrent for those who would aggressively choose business over general morality. He stays in this ring of hatred, regardless of his unseen pains due to his amplified public breakups close friends leaving him, and a series of events that would have anyone in an emotionally difficult place. People choose to view the cold, outward business side of him just like he chooses to use his audience purely for his monetary gain. But something that he is not realizing is money does not buy happiness and is being held down by his prior impulsive decisions. Jake Paul has a monumental task in front of him, similar to his brother Logan Paul, and that is to win the love of the people which now he has been trying to do. But if he relapses and continues his series of scandals, he will be forever stuck fighting, not just the ring that he enjoys getting into, but also the one he seems to be trying to get out of.